Have you ever been around someone who immediately comes to conclusions about a topic right away? Before hearing more information, right, you see this constantly in the news media. People, they want to spew out their opinions before gathering more data, more statistics, more information. And the same thing with social media too, right? There's a lot of people on both sides, liberals and conservatives, who want to be the first person to just uh, have the breaking news before everyone else. And so they're, they're willing to just forego uh, searching and, and looking more into a topic, looking, uh, finding out more information to just be the first one to, to release something. Uh, because there's a lot of pride in being you know, the first one to, to come up with something. Uh, and as humans, we're really quick to jump to conclusions without taking a moment to just breathe. Take a moment to process what we just heard or saw and think a little bit and perhaps even pray. Uh, I think we can all say that, that we fall in victim of that uh, where, where we just jump to conclusions and we don't just slow down and let, and let, and let us think and let us really ponder about what we heard. Uh, People love to be the first to comment or say what they think and feel about a situation or a person, uh, but they didn't even take a moment to pause. And, and we all have initial reactions to situations or people, um, but you got to just take a moment and pause. And some of you right now have probably already come to the conclusion that, you know what, you don't want to listen to what I'm saying. You already tuned me out and I haven't even read any Bible verses. Well, you know, sometimes I tune myself out. So we're, we're right there with each other. OK, but but I believe that we shouldn't tune ourselves out from the word of God. And I believe that we should have a mind and a heart that's soft and, and ready and willing to listen to whatever God has for us and whatever God says and what he's trying to show us individually, not that brother and not that sister what he's trying to show us you're part of the body of Christ right God doesn't have messages only specified for one person or one member he he prepares messages for everybody he prepares messages for everybody not just not just the finger not just the knee not just the foot he prepares it for the entire body and if you're honest, there's something in every single message that can speak to you and help you grow as a Bible-believing Christian. Sure, maybe not everything directly applies to you, but I can tell you that there's something in the message for you, even if it's just the verses, even if it's just one verse or a passage of Scripture. There's something in there for you. So before you completely tune me out, why don't you at least hear the first verse? The title of my sermon is More Hope of a Fool Than a Hasty Man. Let's pray. Um, God, my Father, I just, I come before you, Lord, and I, I ask that you put me aside and you just speak to these people, Lord, through your, through your word, through your holy book, Father. Um, Lord, they, they come to hear you, God. They haven't come to hear man. They haven't come to hear anybody, Lord, but you, God. So I just pray that you would just um, uh, be with us today. Lord, thank you for the, the, great, the great singing and the great teaching, Lord, I, and, and uh, the fellowship. I just pray that you just be with us the rest of the day and, and that we would be thinking about you all the time, Lord, every hour, Father. So I pray all this in, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. My first point is, are your words hasty? Proverbs chapter 29, verse 20. Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? There is more hope of a fool than of him. That's a pretty big statement from the Bible, huh? Right. The person who is rash, quick, speedy to say what's on their mind, the Bible says there is more hope of a fool than that person. Hasty words out of people's mouths are the cause of a lot of problems in their lives. People who are hasty in what they say uh, react quickly to everything around them. The moment that something doesn't appease your flesh, how you're feeling, what you're doing, do you hastily make a bunch of comments? Do you hastily say things without thinking about it? Many times, people, uh, when people hastily respond to a comment or question, their response is usually driven by emotion and not with a clear mind. Yeah. Can you honestly say that, that when you've said something uh, in the heat of the moment that you were thinking clearly? You can't say that. You, you were thinking a lot with your flesh. And a lot with your own wisdom and knowledge and not with what the Bible says. And so uh, since you aren't thinking clearly, you're not thinking logically, you just hastily say whatever you want to say because you're just so important, huh? What comes to your mind is just it's just that important, huh? And then when someone else tries to talk, you just can't seem to be quiet. Maybe you should really pray 
and ask the Lord to help you with being hasty in your words. Have you ever heard or been around someone who thinks that another person simply saying hello has some kind of deeper meaning? Listen, not everybody who is nice to you smiles and says hello is trying to rob you, scam you, or marry you. Okay? All right? There are friendly people who are not thinking that there's more meaning behind a simple hello. I mean, where, has, where have we gone to the point where saying hello and you're like, what's this person trying to do? I mean, come on. Sure, there are people who have hidden motives. There are people who have that. But the devil can get you so out of balance thinking that a simple hello, how are you, means that they want your money. That they want you to do something for them. That they want to be your best friend. Perhaps the reason why you think that about other people is because you do that to others. It's because when you say hello to somebody of the opposite sex, you want to marry them. Or you have, you have some kind of hidden motive behind that. I don't know. Why don't you check your heart? The Bible says a false balance is abomination to the Lord. Think about how many relationships get broken, marriages turned into divorces, fist fights, riots, brawls, wars, getting fired from your job, friends becoming enemies, and so on. And that can oftentimes be narrowed down to hasty words being spoken, right? If, if, if you get fired from your job, uh, sometimes it's because you said something to your boss in the heat of the moment, and your boss is like, all right, you're fired. You can't, you can't take that back. It's already been spoken. The damage has been done. And now you're fired. You're out of a job. That's the reality of the world we live in. And people today, uh, um, you know, that hasty words, they're remembered for a long time. Hasty words, they're often remembered more than the, the words that are sweet, that are thoughtful, that are caring, that are loving, that a loved one says to you or that you say to a loved one. You usually are really quick to remember those words and that, that hurt you and that did damage to you that were hastily spoken towards you. And it's very hard to forget the hasty words that somebody speaks to us. But people constantly react hastily. I mean, it, I think if you could, you could sum up you know, the younger generations is, is they want it quick, right? It's, it's all about quick. It's all about being satisfied in, in 0.5 seconds. And if you're not satisfied, you're on to the next thing and, and you're just scrolling through social media. And I'm sure you've seen those video clips where the news has taken something way out of context. They've just, they've just narrowed something down to five or 10 seconds of what someone said. And then, and then they start claiming that that person is the worst person alive, that they're like worse than the devil because of this five second clip. It's something crazy just to tear them down. And many of you know how that the news media has done this constantly. They've done this to conservatives, editing videos to make them seem like they're horrible people. And then you go back and you find the original clip and you're like, that's actually not that bad. What? Like, you, see it, you see it now in more light. You see it because you, you took the time to go back and see what they were actually saying. And, and if you would just find the original video, you would find out it's not bad. But trolls do that all the time to Pastor Kim on YouTube, don't they? They only play a clip without its full context and then deceive people. Listen, if you don't take the time to find out what he said in context or actually watch his teaching before you come to a conclusion, there's something wrong with you, not with Pastor. And there's something wrong with you if you come to a conclusion about what Pastor taught based off somebody else's reaction to his teaching. Listen, you should just come to the conclusion on your own. But why do you have to go and search what somebody else said about what he said? Why don't you go to the source and find out for, for yourself? Listen, Pastor Kim, uh, he says, if you don't, uh, he says, don't believe what he's saying, right? In so many videos, don't believe what he's saying. Look at your Bible. Study the verses yourself. Look at the articles or videos. Quit being lazy. Because don't trust him. He could be deceiving you. He's just some guy on YouTube, right? He's just some guy on YouTube. After all, you are watching him on YouTube. If you think that Gene Kim is a cult leader, what cult leader tells his members to study out everything he says for themselves, huh? What, what, what cult leader... Uh, gives you all the references for you to look up. Yeah. He literally tells you, this is where I got it. This article, you know, this, this book, this page, here you go. I give you everything. He gives you everything. Yeah. 
and, and, and what cult leader tells you he could be wrong about a new teaching? I, I've never heard that from any cult leader say that they could be wrong about a new teaching. No, when they come up with something, they say, this is the truth. This is doctrine. This is, you have to believe this. But he doesn't do that. He says, this is a new teaching, and I'm not sure this could be wrong. But he's willing to, he's willing to take the time to look into things that are interesting so that you can go look at it yourself. So that you can take the time to start uh, searching those things out. And, and um, uh, have you ever heard of pastor try to ban books from anyone's possessions? Like communist countries or other places where they try to take books like they do in, in you know, they're doing that in colleges and universities. Taking books away from, from, from uh, curriculum, taking the Bible out of schools. Does pastor do that with you guys? No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't ban books out of your possession. He doesn't, he doesn't try to take away those things. Uh, does, he, does he try to have you move away to a mountain, away from your family and friends? No. Did he try to make you quit your job to make you serve in the church, to make you work in the church, perhaps even change your diet? No, he didn't do any of that. He hasn't done any of that. Has, has he ever said that only people in Baptist churches are saved? Or only those in King James Bible-believing churches are saved? No, there's, there's a lot of people in a lot of churches who are saved, and they're not going to a Baptist church. They're not going to a King James-only, Bible-believing, dispensational church. And Pastor Kim believes that. But what you do here is read your Bible for yourself, huh? Yeah, amen. What you do here is don't simply listen to the Bible being quoted or read to you on a screen because even that could deceive you. Even that could deceive people. That's what you hear. If there's a teaching or a subject that you don't understand or disagree with, why don't you ask him some questions? Why don't you just ask him some questions? He'd be more than happy to take some time to show you in more detail what he taught. Amen. Especially if you're someone in this church, if you're someone attending the church, don't just sit there and go, I don't like that. I, just, I disagree with that. I think he's wrong about that. Right. Pastor Kim makes it clear if he's not teaching something as doctrine, what does he say? It's not doctrine. It's not doctrine. Did you catch that? Have you ever caught that in any of his videos? Or do you just go, do you just skip over that and then you, you play wherever you want to play and then start critiquing and criticizing him after he said it's not doctrine? Come on. Come on. You call yourself honest? Man. It's just an interesting teaching that he's making you aware of. And you can study it out if you like. You don't have to, but hey, if you like to, go ahead and study it. And when something is a doctrinal statement, he says it's doctrine. If it's clear from scripture, this is doctrine. But at least give the man an opportunity to explain it to you. Is that too much to ask? Is that too much to, to, for you to do? Be careful in thinking that you're the only Christian who has right doctrine. Or you're the, uh, and everyone else out there is a heretic. You're not the only person who has right doctrine. Or the people in your church are the ones who are saved. Last time I checked, the Bible says that the body of Christ has many members. It doesn't say it has a few members. It says many members. Your local church with 100, 200, 300, 1,000, 5,000, maybe even 15,000 members, they're not the entire body of Christ. Your family is not the entire body of Christ. The entire body of Christ is huge. You can't see it all. Man, and the only qualification... For being a member of the body of Christ is accepting the free gift of salvation by admitting you're a sinner, believing that Jesus is God who died, buried and resurrected and confessing that belief to him. It's that simple. You're in the body of Christ. Boom. There you go. You're part of him now. And nothing else and nobody can take you out. Nothing else and nobody can take you out. Praise the Lord that salvation is a gift from God because if it was a gift from man, it would be horrible. People would just be, be taking it back constantly, right? God just says, no, here you go. You take it. You've got it. It's yours. Praise the Lord that he did it and God saved my soul and he saved your soul too, right? And he did it through his only begotten son, a Jewish carpenter. A Jewish carpenter. How about that, huh? My second point is, are your words many? Are your words many? It, it's interesting how the Bible uh, talks about the hasty person in verse 20, huh? Uh, other people have more hope in a fool than that hasty man. Look, look at uh, Proverbs 29, verse 11, just a few verses back. 
The Bible says, A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. A fool uttereth all his mind. Now you might be thinking to yourself, I don't really see the difference between these two verses, right? A fool and, and a hasty man, they kind of they seem like they're the same person. But if you look at it, the hasty man doesn't utter all his mind. He's the type of man who's going to ask you a question and then interrupt your answer after you just began your sentence. Or after you've finished your sentence, he'll interrupt you with another question. Or he'll just simply disagree and end the conversation. He doesn't want to hear it. Yeah, I don't like what you're saying. You're, you're, you're full of it. You're not, you, don't, you don't get it. You don't get it. No, you're not saying what I want to hear, so I'm not going to listen to you. He's the man who makes up his mind before you even finish your sentence. And he still denies and hastily comes to a different conclusion, regardless of whether or not you have all the facts and the evidence in your favor. He just says, no, I don't like it. I, I, I come to a different conclusion. Um, or he decides that he's just right because of his experience, because of his background, where he comes from. Well, what do you think? Who do you, you know, who do you think you are? What do you know? You don't know who I am. Don't judge me, he says, because the Bible says judge not as he clearly is judging you, as he clearly is judging you. Don't judge me. Judge not. That's the type of man that verse 20 is talking about. This man, he never says all that's on his mind. You realize that. It just says that, that, uh, uh, he's hasty with his words, but he doesn't utter all his mind. He thinks that he's smarter than the fool who utters all his mind. He looks at the fool and he goes, man, that guy's foolish. I'm, I, I, I know more than him. I'm better than him. Yeah, that's what you think. But the reality is that there's more hope in a fool than that hasty man. Look back at verse 11. The fool does do something foolish. He utters all his mind. I mean, that's pretty foolish, huh? Somebody who just blabbers on, just talking all the time. Like, don't take a moment to pause and just relax. Like, that's pretty foolish. But guess what? If you realize the verse says that you'll have a chance, you'll have an opportunity to speak with this fool without being interrupted at the end of your first sentence if you are wise. Because what does it say? But a wise man keepeth it until afterwards. It doesn't say that the wise man never speaks. It says he keeps it until afterwards. Meaning, if you're wise, there will be a moment in which you can talk to that fool. You just got to wait. You just got to be a little bit patient, a little long suffering with that with that fool. And you'll be able to speak with them. But all so all that while that fool is talking, the wise man is listening and he's just letting that fool keep on talking, keep on hearing the key points to respond back to that fool, to ask them questions as to why they believe or, or what they believe in. And make the fool defend their stance, right? For those of us who, who have been doing the soul winning with pastor, what does he say? He says, make the atheist defend their stance. Make the atheist prove why God doesn't exist. You don't have to be the one to prove why God exists all the time. Let the atheist come up with the points. Let the atheist uh, spew their mouth and tell you all their mind. Let them come up with the stuff. Because all of their, all their talking points are garbage. So, so just, just, just wait, because the Bible says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. So that fool, they're going to say something stupid, and then you can respond. <laughs> you just got to wait for that moment, and then you can respond to them. Uh, and listen, you're not going to know everything that fool's talking about. Because they're uttering all their mind. You really think that you can understand everything on, on that person's mind? You can't understand everything on their mind. You're not going to know it. That's not the point. And because they are a fool. But there will be maybe one or two things which you know really well about what they said. You, you know, you know uh, great witnessing tactics of, of what they said. And you're going to narrow in on, one, on those one or two points. You're going to have a scope and you're waiting. You're, you're, you're looking at that fool and you're waiting for that fool to say something that you know that you can laser in on and talk to them about. You're, you're, you're going to push aside the rest of the garbage. I mean, it's all garbage. But you're going to push aside most of that garbage to look at that one point that you know really well, that you, that you have down, that you can, that you can really remember from, from witnessing witnessing or soul winning or whatever and you're gonna dial in on that and you're gonna you're gonna narrow in on that and you're gonna steer the conversation into witnessing about Jesus Christ and listen the wise man never says all his points he just says just enough to show them why they're wrong 
He just says enough to show them that, that they're in error. Right. And uh, you got to have a poker face, right? You got to have a poker face. Listen, they don't have, they're not even in the game. They don't have any cards whatsoever. You have all the cards in your hand. You have, you have all the advantage. You're not the fool. They are. They don't believe in God. Hey, you believe in God. That, that's, that's, a good, that's a good starting point, huh? That makes you a little bit, that makes you at least not a fool, right? That, that's a good point. That's a good starting point. But, but you don't have to show them everything. You don't have to give them all of your arguments. You just have to give them enough to show them that you are right. Right. And, and, and if you don't know about, you know, uh, having a poker face, just ask Brother Jared. OK. Uh, but uh, but you have to be you have to be wise with God's wisdom. You have to be wise with God's wisdom in order to have a chance to speak with the fool. Right. You can't just have the world's wisdom thinking that you're going to uh, get a chance to speak to the fool. You're not. You're not. You have to have God's wisdom. So if you. So if you don't even if you don't know anything, I'd encourage you just to know a little bit, because you'd be surprised if you just know the basics of, of some of their arguments of of any anybody's argument who's who's lost. You'd be surprised some of the, just some of the basics of those false religions of atheism that you'd be able to witness and lead that soul to the Lord. Right. Just knowing one or two things, yeah, right. because. Let's be honest, atheists really don't know what they believe in. They really have no clue. Their, their arguments, their arguments are all over the place. It's not structured. It has no, it has no substance. It has no meat. You have all the meat and you have, you just need to know one or two things. Just the basics, just the basics. So I encourage you, brethren, just know some basics, all right? Uh, my third point is, is your spirit hasty? Is your spirit hasty? The Bible doesn't just negatively talk about ha being hasty with words. It also talks about not being hasty in your spirit. Turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, right after Proverbs. Verse 8. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Don't be hasty in thy spirit when you're listening to the preaching of God's word. Don't be hasty to do something you'll regret by immediately getting angry without a cause. Sometimes we can get angry without a cause, right? And that's not a good thing because our spirit is, we're, we're getting hasty in our spirit. We're not thinking clearly. And so righteous anger is biblical. Being, being angry in the right way, as the Bible shows, it, I mean, it's biblical, right? Jesus got angry. He, he, he made a whip and he started whipping those, you know, those tables and flipping over and getting people out of the, the temple and stuff like that. that. There are times where you do need to be angry. And it is something that you should do from time to time. But being angry without a cause can lead to your destruction. Go over to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 19. James chapter 1, verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. The Bible says to be swift to hear. Are you hearing God's words? What about when pastor talks, do you listen with ready ears? Or another brother who comes and preaches behind the pulpit, a missionary or an evangelist or another pastor or just another brother in the church who comes and preaches behind the pulpit. Have you honestly listened with open ears to hear what God wants to speak to you every single time? Have you honestly listened with open ears? Why do you come to church? Is it for the fellowship for eating, getting physically fed. Look, those are great things. Praise the Lord, we have that. But is it for any other reason besides hearing the preaching of the Word of God? If, if a church doesn't have a preaching of the Word of God, that's a pretty spiritually dead church. I've been in churches where, where the preaching doesn't hit at all. And the people are just sitting there dead, spiritually. They're, they're, they're physically there, but spiritually they're dead. 
and they're just going through the motions. They're not, they're not getting anything out of it. So if the preaching of the word of God isn't there, if it has no power, that's a dangerous church to be in. That's a dangerous church to be in. You want to get out of that church real fast and find a church where the preaching has some power. Amen. Slow to speak. That's some pretty good advice, huh? Maybe so you don't look so foolish all the time, right? Maybe so you're not spewing out all, everything that you know and everything that you think you know. Or, and, or being hasty with whatever comes out of your mouth. Have you ever been talking to someone who just constantly finishes your sentences? The, you're talking, and then they're just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then they just try to finish your sentences. And at first, you're like, that's not that bad. They just did it one or two times. You can handle that, right? But then it keeps on going. Yeah. And you're like, oh, this is really annoying. Yeah, right. And either, e either two things will happen. Either you're going to get really angry and upset and start yelling and get all mad, or you're just going to shut up. You're going to be like, all right, go ahead. Just talk. You want to talk? Go ahead. You, you, seem, you, seem, to, you seem to know what I'm going to say. Go ahead and talk. Go ahead. Knock your socks off. And you're, gonna, you're just going to sit there. Right? The, you're, those are the only two things that are going to happen. And, uh, but do you do that with God's word sometimes? When you're reading through the Bible and you go, oh, I know that verse, so you skip down to the next one. Or I know that, I know that chapter, so you just skip over it. That's a dangerous place to be in. Listen, I'm sure every one of us could hear, could quote Romans 8, 28. But do you skip that verse when you read through Romans 8? Do you just go, oh, yeah, I know Romans 8, 28, and you just quickly quote it and get through it. And then God's not even speaking to you. God's not even the one speaking to you. You're not even let the word speak to you. So we can get too much in a hurry sometimes when reading or praying and we miss some of those blessings and nuggets from God. That would increase our faith, increase our knowledge, and increase our understanding of his word. We got to slow down and take our time to let God speak to us through every single word in the Bible. Every single word. And once you've been swift to hear, slow to speak, do you think being slow to wrath will be easier? Oh yeah. If you're swift to hear and slow to speak, being slow to wrath becomes a whole lot easier. And when we take the time to listen to preaching and see where we need to make changes in our life, the less likely we are to get angry. When we take the time to let God speak to us through the Bible, those feelings of, of anger without a cause will diminish away. They'll go away. And the beautiful thing about the Bible is that God's never done speaking. He'll, he'll keep talking to you if you let him. If you just keep going through it, he'll just keep talking to you. He'll just keep having a conversation with you. Man, but... Sometimes we don't want that, huh? Sometimes we just want to shut God up and, and don't let him talk. Uh, but, but if you'll let him, he'll show you new things. Each time you go through that book, each time you go through that Bible, he'll show you new things. If you have a soft heart and just take some time. That's all it takes. A soft heart and just a little bit of time. Just a little bit of time. And listen, that Bible is yours. Sure, it's written for everybody. Don't get me wrong, it's written for everybody. But that Bible is given by God to you. It's a gift. I mean, it really is. It's a, it's a miracle. It's a gift that God's preserved his words for you. He's preserved his words for you. Do you realize that? Do you accept that? Or do you just go, yeah, the Bible's for everybody else. Maybe that's why you kind of grown cold in the Lord is because you're thinking that the Bible's for everybody else and you haven't really gotten personal and said, no, that's my Bible. That's my Bible. And uh, false religions like Catholicism say you can't understand the Bible. That's what they did during the, uh, uh, what, the Inquisitions and stuff. They said, no, you can't understand the Bible. It has to be only in uh, Latin or whatever that they were trying to preach in. And so you can't understand it because that's not the language that you common folk are reading. So you have to be read the Bible. You can't read it yourself. They didn't want you to read it yourself, huh? So that they could be the ones to, to, to try to make you believe what they believe. And uh, you also have Greek and, he Greek and Hebrew scholars claim that the Bible only exists in original manuscripts. So nobody truly has God's words. Nobody really has it. Listen, that's all garbage. 
You have a Bible inspired by God. You have a Bible inspired by God, written down, given to you, and it's all perfect in the King James Bible. So make that Bible yours. Put your name on it. Mark it up. Put, cry in it. Get some tears. Get, you know, make it yours. Have a personal relationship with this book. Um, I remember uh, listening to, to uh, a preacher on Final Fight, um, and he was, he was sharing a story about how one person in the church uh, offered him a chance to go on a vacation. And they said, you know, preacher, listen, you do a lot of work. You work really hard. We want you to go and enjoy yourself. So just, just, uh, just leave your Bible at home and just take your, take your, you know, bring your stuff and just go, go vacation, right? And what he said, he said, listen, you know, you, thank, thank you for the offer. You know, you're really kind. But anywhere my, where my Bible's not welcome, I'm not welcome. Anywhere where my Bible's not welcome, I'm not welcome. And he also said, it's a whole lot easier for me to go on a trip and just take my Bible than everything else that I need. Grab all my clothes, my toiletries. He said, it's really easy to just pick up the book and just, you know what, I'm going on a trip. Going on, I'm going on vacation, just me and the book. And it's a whole lot easier. It's a whole lot easier. So make that Bible yours. Make that Bible yours. God doesn't show everything to one person. You know that? He doesn't just show everything to one person. He didn't tell, God, uh, Jesus didn't tell his disciples everything. He said there are some things in which you, you won't know. That there, right. there are some things that I can't tell you. Right. And, the, and he gave Paul the gospel for the Gentiles. He didn't give that to his disciples, the 12, the 12 dudes who were following him. So closely, he gave that to Paul. Paul never met Jesus. Right, right, right. Jesus spoke to him and gave him that. And guess what? Now we have Paul's gospel. Right. We, have how, uh, we have grace through faith. Yep. But guess what? He shows things to different people at different times. Yeah. And, and the Bible was written by more than 40 men who got filled with the Holy Spirit and used to write down your Bible. And he did it over roughly 1,500 years. Mm, yeah. And a lot of people criticize the Bible, go, you know, the Bible has all these all these men wrote the Bible, and, and, and uh, the Gospels contradict each other. So that's, that's the reason why the Bible doesn't exist. No, it proves the strength of the Bible. Because God showed things to uh, not just one person. If he showed it to one man, guess what? We'd all be praising that man. Right. Wouldn't we? We'd all be like, wow, that, that was the guy who God just used to write the entire Bible. But he didn't do that. He, he gave it to different people at different times to prove the strength of the Bible, to show that, you know what, these people could quote these, these other authors and they've never read them before. Or they, never, they didn't have any idea what they were saying. They were just quoting stuff from all over the place. The, New, the Old Testament was prophesying stuff in the New Testament. Did they have any idea that the New Testament writers would write that? No. Do they have any clue that people in the future would really would study it out and make all these connections? No, they just wrote it. It proves the power of God's word and it proves that why God uh, that proves why he chose so many men over such a long period of time. And perhaps he wants to also show you that uh, no single man was given inspiration of the word of God so that he'll show you some things if you let him. He'll show you some things if you give him the opportunity to. He's not just going to show your pastor something or another brother or sister. He does show your pastor a lot of stuff. But he's going to show you some things as well. He's going to show you some things as well. Do you think he just cares about the pastors and not you? He died for all of us. The pastors are the ones who are leading, guiding the church. And he's, gonna, he's probably going to give them away more than any of us because he's the one who's teaching and preaching. But he's still going to give you some stuff because he loves and cares about you. He'll, he'll sprinkle some nuggets. He'll get you some gold. He'll do that for you. But the wrath of man is, is not something you want to play with, brethren. It's not something you should desire to grow in. You need to get a grip on that fleshy wrath because as James 1.20 says, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So this is not righteous anger. And, and that's all flesh. That, uh, that anger, that wrath, that verse, that verse 20 is talking about, it's all flesh. So when that flesh is the one taking control over your actions and guiding you, you need to take a moment and pray. Take a moment and ask the Lord to help you. Because if you don't get that wrath under control, it can lead to your death. There's one example which 
Many of us know very well, and you know, how, how did most of you get to the church? You drove here, right? And I'm not saying that any of, us, any of you do, but if you drive with road rage, you got to stop. You got to stop if you drive with road rage. It's not good for you. You can get seriously injured or die. And what kind of a testimony would it be if you cause somebody to die Whoa. due to your road rage? Whoa. What if you what if you cause somebody to be seriously injured due to your road rage? Wow, wow that that's a good testimony, huh? Yeah. But it's funny how quickly we and easily we justify our, our bad driving, huh? Well, somebody cut me off. They drove recklessly, uh, almost hit me. So that's why I had to dangerously change lanes, speed up in front and cut them off. Oh. What? Yeah. Really? So it makes it right all of a sudden to drive like a maniac in order to teach them a lesson when they almost killed you with their road rage. They almost hurt you with your road rage. And then all of a sudden, you just decided to get all fleshly. And, you, and listen, if you drive with road rage, think of the testimony you show your kids. Do you think your kids are going to drive responsibly and safely if for the past 17, 18 years of their life, they've seen you drive like you're, you're in the Indy 500? Or, or you're, you're, you're like some street racer going, going through you know, the F1, whatever? They're not going to do that if they've seen you lead a bad, have a bad example in your life. They're going, my, uh, you know what? My, my mom, my dad, they drove crazy and they're fine. Guess what? Once I get my whip, I can, I can, I can be fine. I'm good. They, they, they didn't die. I'll be fine. Those of you who don't have kids, because there's a lot of us, think about being a good example to your little niece or nephew. That little niece or nephew that gets in your car and goes, I want to be like uncle so-and-so. I want to be like, like uh, auntie so-and-so. And they start seeing you get all crazy in the car. You think that when they get older, they're going to drive like that or they're going to drive responsibly? They're going to drive like you drive because they want to be like you. What about those little brothers and sisters in Christ that you're showing an example to? What kind of testimony are you to, to the little brothers and sisters who look up to big bro, big sis in the church, huh? Who, who, who when, they, when they see you, they go, listen, you do realize that the younger kids look up to older people, right? Younger, younger people look up to older people and go, I want to be like them. You may not be somebody special, but they're looking at you and they're going, I, I want to be like them. I want to be like bro, big bro in the church. I want to be like big sis in the church. And if they're looking at you and, and you're thinking that, oh, it's so fun to have road rage and just drive all crazy and, and just, you know, uh, drive however I want because that's how I am. And then they're going, oh, wow, that, that's kind of cool. You know, they also got a nice car and they're safe. No scratches. Nothing's happened so far. I'm going to follow them. What a, what a sad thing and what a, what a horrible, tragic would it be if, if somebody got into an accident because of your bad driving, huh? My fourth point is, is your hearing swift? Is your hearing swift? Be careful what you say, whether you are by yourself, with one person or a group of people, because the Bible says that God is above you and he hears every word spoken. You think it's, it's not that big of a deal to just curse somebody out if brethren aren't around you or to say an inappropriate joke with, with friends or family or whatever thing comes to your mind. No, the Bible gives you a warning. Go over to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Verse 2. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let thine heart, let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon the earth. Therefore let thy words be few. Uh, don't be rash to say everything that comes to your mind. There are things that are better not said, amen. amen. <laughs> nobody nobody wants or needs to hear all of the lies you've ever told in your life. Nobody wants or needs to hear all of the, uh, the, the bad thoughts you've ever had in your life and all of the sins you've ever committed. If, someone, if someone's asking you to share with them all of those things, there's something weird about that person. <laughs> there's something weird about that person, all right? 
you, you, thought, you thought the person who smiled at you and said hello was trying to get something out of you. No, that person who wants to hear all of your deep, dark stuff, they want to get something out of you. They want to be, they want to have some blackmail on you or, or something crazy like that. You better watch out. You, you, better, you, better, you better watch out for that false balance. And doesn't the Bible say that we should be simple concerning evil? Have you ever heard that before? Turn over to Romans 16. Romans 16, verse 19. The Bible says, For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. As Christians, we should be as ignorant as possible when it comes to doing wrong, when it comes to sinful things. But unfortunately, there are Christians who like to brag about how much they know regarding something evil, about something completely wicked, okay. yeah. 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 something totally wicked that, shouldn't, that you shouldn't be anywhere close to. Right. Really check your heart and mind if you have a desire to intensely study and be no the most knowledgeable person regarding the evils in the world. Mm. You don't need to experience sin to know it's bad for you. Right. But yet there are people who want to experience everything for themselves and it leads to their destruction. Mm -hmm. Stay as simple concerning evil as you can. Yes. The evils in the world, are, they're only going to increase. Yeah. They're only going to get more and more as we get closer to the rapture. Right. Good preaching, brother. And the world is going to keep falling into more wickedness. So why are you going to keep falling into more of what they're doing? Why are you going to keep studying more of what they're doing? Switch. Get away from that. God would much rather want you thinking about things that will get you closer to Him. Things that will get you to have closer fellowship with Him. Which is Philippians chapter 4. Let's go ahead and turn over there. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, verse 8. The Bible says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on these things. I mean, what is truth? The Bible says, John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Get in that book and do a word study on Philippians 4, 8. Do a word study on, on, on uh, true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good, report, virtue, praise. Think on these things. Why don't you do that? Get in that book. Do, do a word study. Just study. Just, just search in your Bible app. Search on, on the King James Bible online. Just, just do a quick search. Search for those words. Do some cross-references. Get in that book a little bit. You know, studying the Bible is not as hard as you think. Do, doing a simple word, word search gets you a lot of fruit. Gives you, gives you a lot of blessing out of just a simple word search. Right. Just a simple word search. Right. Right. So... See what the Bible says about each of these things. Maybe that's why you've been struggling to walk closer with God is because all you're thinking about is World War III. Gas prices and food prices increasing by the minute. Inflation, the economy. I'm not saying don't ever think about the things that are going on around you. But do you spend even just 15 minutes a day reading your Bible? Just 15 minutes? Do you ever lose track of time doing a study or reading a commentary? When was the last time that, that you got so into a study you forgot what time it was? You forgot when you started and you're like, man, I don't even know how much time's passed. Right. When was the last time that happened to you? Has that ever happened to you? Some of you lose track of time scrolling through social media. I've been guilty of that. I've been guilty of that. Some of you, some of you once, maybe more than once a day lose track of scrolling through social media. But... For some reason, when it comes to the Bible, you can't get lost in that book. Let's get in that truth, that King James Bible. Let's get in some prayer time, huh? How about, how about the last time you had an all-night prayer meeting? What about an all-minute prayer meeting? Just one minute. Just one minute, really just intensely praying to the Lord and asking the Lord for some help or, or praising the Lord 
for one minute, huh? Well, let's all get closer to God so that He could show us things from our Bible, each of us. That Bible is yours. Make it yours. Get a personal relationship with Him. He wants, to grow in, he wants you to grow in fellowship. So think on some lovely things, Christian. Don't think everything is doom and gloom. Cheer up. You're on, you're on the winning side. You're on your way to heaven. Amen. Yeah. Amen, brother. That's all I got. The altar call is open. The altar call is open. I don't know what, what it is that uh, the Lord spoke to you through, through the verses or through anything, but I just you know, pray that you would have a desire to want to get in that book and just think on some lovely things that the Lord has for you. He has lovely things for everyone. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if you're not saved, if you've never experienced the love of Jesus Christ, you need to trust in Him today. Trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation so that you could start getting some lovely and true things from the Bible, getting some, getting some uh, beautiful things that God has for you. He wants, to, he wants to make you more holy. He wants to make you more pure. He doesn't want to lead you down a path of wickedness and sin and evil. He doesn't want you to get always caught up with all the tragedies going on in the world and all of the things that are happening around us. That stuff's endless. That stuff's endless. And in the midst of everything going on, in the midst of everything that was going on in Paul's life, what was he saying? Whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. He wants to get your thought life in order. He wants you to start thinking about some nice things. The Lord doesn't want bad things for you. He talks about it. He says, you know, if, a, if your earthly father is going to give you good gifts, how much more will your heavenly father give you good gifts? Your heavenly father who, who loves you and cares about you, who created you, who died for your sins. You do realize that, right? Your heavenly father died for your sins. Why do you think he would want you to experience and, and, and study the evils of the world? He wants to... He, took you away from that for a reason. He said, you don't have to think about that. Just think about my son. Just think about Jesus Christ. Just think about the Bible. You know, as we approach the rapture, as we're getting closer, we're getting closer every day. And, and there's a lot more going on, it seems, every single day. And a lot that can take away our attention and our mind and our focus. And sometimes all we just need is to be reminded of how good God is for us, how good He is to us, and the things that the Bible says that how much He cares about us and loves us and really wants to show us some things. And I pray that you would, uh, that you would really get close to the Lord. I mean, we pray that we would all get close to the Lord. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for for being so good to us. Thank you for dying on that cross of Calvary, Lord. None of us would be here if it wasn't for you. None of us would, uh, we don't know where we would be. We'd be lost and without hope in this world, but thank you, Lord, that we can have hope in the midst of everything going on, that we do have a hope, that you're coming back. You're coming to take us. And thank you, Lord, that you have, you have a perfect word for us. You have a perfect word that wants to guide us and to be there with us all, all the steps of our, of our days, to be there our entire life. Whenever we're going through something, your word has the answer, whether it's pain, sorrow, sickness, going through tough times financially with, or with family and friends. The word is always there and it always has the right answer for us. 
But sometimes we neglect that word and we just hastily move along in our life. And I pray, Lord, that you would get us to slow down sometimes and just to see the things that you would have us to see and to see the things that you would want us to do. And to be with all these uh, be with all these people today, whatever they've got going on. I pray that you'd uh, be with them and guide them and establish their, their thoughts. And thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name, 